Compton is the birthplace of the Power Rules, and it has several sets of this umbrella come from this area. Today, we're dressed in the Lime Hood Power Rules. This gang has been around since the late 1970s, and from the jump, they were terrorizing the streets of Compton. Yeah, gang wars, drive-bys, extortion schemes, and several walk-down murders, this gang has all that and so much more in their history. So they definitely have a story to tell. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Cali's Most Dangerous. Let's get into it. That's how we feel. If we die, it's like we go kill one of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of them die, because they down for it. They'll get took out. And then guess what happens after one of them die? And they come back. And then it's right. a few until they don't want no more, until everybody just drop it. But ain't nobody gonna drop it. MR was a member of the Ma Paru gang, which was associated with the Bloods. PM also was associated with the Ma Paru's. MR was friends with Sazaz Mohammed Khan, who was a member of the Lime Hood Paru's, and called him Knock. Well, on July 7th, 2014, MR saw Khan and told him that PM wanted to talk to him about the fact that his brother had been shot. And MR arranged for them to meet while another individual occupied PM to the meeting. MR, who had traveled with PM and the other individual to the meeting, went up to Khan's apartment to get him. They both came down and Khan arrived to the meeting location. PM punched Khan in the face immediately though, and a fight ensued a few seconds later. The individual who accompanied PM tried to join the fight. When the fight was over, PM and his friends left in the car. MR stayed behind with Khan and explained that he had nothing to do with the fight. Khan, he was angry and he wanted to fight PM. He also noticed that his necklace was missing. MR called PM's brother and let him know that Khan wanted to fight. PM agreed to fight and they made arrangements the following day. The following day, MR went to PM's brother's house. PM and an individual from the night before showed up. MR and the other individual got into an altercation over the individual's involvement in the previous day's fight between PM and Khan. Afterwards, MR shook hands with PM and explained that he did not want to be a part of the sucker punch that occurred the day before. They shook hands, however, MR told him that Khan still had a problem with him. PM told MR, go get him. Yeah, friendly fades, they happen often in the hood. As long as you're not no bitch, win or loss, shake hands after, and you keep it pushing. But let's keep playing attention, because shit played out a lot differently that night. At around 5 p.m., MR got into his car and drove to Khan's apartment to let him know that PM was waiting for him. Khan got in a white van with two other associates and followed MR's car back to a cul sac in Rialto. When they arrived, PM and the individual who had fought MR earlier were waiting for him. When Khan and one of his friends approached PM, MR walked over and told Khan that Khan was going to be fighting PM. According to MR, Khan already knew who was going to be fighting PM. MR then told Khan's friend, if you want to fight, you can fight that guy that tried to jump in. PM and his friend approached Khan and Khan's friend in the middle of the street. The parties were about five feet away from each other. MR had walked to the sidewalk to get out of the way. He intended to stand back and watch the fight. PM pulled his shorts up, ready to fight. But Khan put a gun out of his waist and pointed it at PM. After a few seconds, Khan pulled the trigger, but a bullet wasn't in the chamber. Khan then chambered around and started shooting towards PM letting off at least four to five shots. When the shots were fired, MR hid behind a car. After Khan shot multiple times, he and his friend fled the scene. After the shooting, PM was laying on his stomach. MR and some of the other people standing around picked up PM and put him in the backseat of MR's trailblazer and took him to a hospital. Unfortunately, PM was pronounced dead at the hospital though. Look, that definitely wasn't in that situation. Shit played out dangerously for other parties who had nothing to do with the situation. Sadly, in California, in the law, and in the streets, you're often guilty by association. And that often comes with daily results. But before we get into what else transpired, let's get into who are the Lime Hood, Paru Bloods. You're willing, to, you're willing to die for whatever this cause is? If that's what it takes. Yeah, I'm not saying you want to. I'm saying you will. No, would. I don't want to. But if, if somebody ride up on me and take me out, I guess it was my time to go like that. But ain't nobody did it yet, so I guess it ain't my time to go. How old are you? I'm 17. The Lime Hood Pyrus, also known as the Lime Hood Bontham Pyrus, are primarily an African-American street gang located on the east side of Compton, California. Let's touch on races though, because from the foundation of the Lime Hoods, these guys have always had other races. It's Blacks, Samoans, Mexicans, and much more from the set. 
Their neighborhood stretches from Rosecrans Avenue to Compton Boulevard between Atlantic Avenue and Gibson Avenue. When it comes to their name, they're named after a popular residential street in the neighborhood called Lime Street in the city of Compton. In terms of colors, the Lime Hood members often wear green to associate with the Lime along with the burgundy to associate with the Paru gangs. Quick question though, in terms of attire, I couldn't really find anything on them in terms of like what they wear. So do they wear like a certain hat or logos or anything like that? Anybody tapped in or if y'all know, go ahead and let me know in the comments, man. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's have a conversation. Anyways, the Lion Hood Parus are considered a smaller blood gang compared to bigger blood gangs in Los Angeles. But that means absolutely nothing when it comes to this gang's militant means of operation and brutality. Because of this, they have always been in the headlines. In fact, CBS News launched West 57, which was a short-lived news magazine series during the 1980s, and the show visited East Compton to interview a 17-year-old Dusty Lope and his friends who were all members of Lime Hood Pyro's. These are baby gangsters. <laughs> baby gangsters. Baby gangsters. Yeah. gangsters. Call us BG. Now, you're, you're proud of the fact that you're you're in the gang. Lime Hood, yeah. Lime Hood, but you're, you're proud of the fact that you're blood. Yeah. Why is that? Why? Yeah. Because I'm down. I'm down for it, because I'm a true I'm a true I come from the heart. But wh why? Wh wh why, is, why being a gang? What's in it for you? What's in it? I mean, you can get killed, right? Yeah. Well, you mean some of your friends been killed? Yeah. So for a so simple cause. Well, what's, so, what, what, what's the simple cause? Of being a blood. I tried looking up info on the current situation of Dusty, but I couldn't find anything on him. So anybody tapped in or members of the Lion Hood, quick question for y'all. What's Dusty Look been up to? Hopefully he's well and alive and doing his thing, but y'all let me know in the comments though. Look, I can't tell y'all where Dusty is. It's a lot of speculation about him, but I could definitely explain what played out for Lion Hood Power member Khan. Let's get into it. Investigators spoke with MR and the other individuals at the hospital. The investigators informed him that PM had died. They were all transported to Rialto Police Department and interviewed individually. MR told the text that he, his cousin AW, and a guy named J-Rock met PM in a cul-de-sac in Rialto. They were waiting for PM's brother to arrive when MR heard gunshots. He initially told detectives that he did not see the shooter. During a second interview with detectives though, MR admitted that PM and Khan had a conflict over PM's former girlfriend. MR helped arrange the meeting, but he wanted to be a peacekeeper. But when the meeting occurred, Khan did not even attempt to talk to PM. Instead, Khan just started shooting. MR said Khan was the only shooter. MR felt like both Khan and PM had used him. A forensic pathologist performed an autopsy on PM. A bullet was located in his left chest area and an entry room was found in his back. The bullet struck the kidney, spleen, and the heart. The pathologist opined that PM died within minutes of a gunshot wound to his chest. Khan's mother lived with their husband as well as their daughter, Khan, and one of Khan's friends in an apartment in San Bernardino. At 9.45, on July 8, 2014, after the murder of a PM, Khan's mother was taking a plate of food to some neighbors where she heard five or six gunshots at her apartment. When she returned to her apartment, she discovered her husband had been shot and killed. Her daughter also had been shot. According to Khan's mother, on the dead PM's death, Khan looked agitated and told her that two black men from West Covina attempted to jump him in front of her apartment. Khan told her that they stole his necklaces as well. Later that day, when Khan's mother returned from work, Khan was not there, but MR was outside the house bleeding from a busted lip. When she later spoke with Khan on the phone and told him that his stepfather had been murdered and his sister had been shot, Khan responded, my bad, mom. I'm sorry. Khan later told his mother that people from Ma Paru were out to get him and they would not stop until they killed everyone. They put a hit on his whole family. Khan warned his mother not to go back to the apartment, so she rented a car and then the two skipped town. Khan, he was on a run for two years. He was later located by the Department of Corrections Fugitive Apprehension Team in 2016. They found him hiding out in an apartment in Barstow. Khan tried to convince the jury that he was not the shooter with several alibis, but in the end, the jury convicted Zaz Muhammad Khan to first degree murder and the court sentenced him to a term of 25 years to life for the conviction, plus an additional 25 years of life for the firearm enhancements. Yeah, this story played out daily for all parties involved. It's a prime example of how gang banging, it's a dangerous gang. Literally, nobody is safe if they have some type of affiliation to a gang. 
That's the history of gangbanging though. And that's definitely the history of the Lion Hood Paru Bloods. Speaking of history, let's go back a few decades as we address a few more crazy ass stories and go over the history of the Lion Hood Paru Bloods. The Lion Hood Paru Bloods were formed and established in around 1978 and 1979 in Compton, California. Some of the founders of Lion Hood include Gangsta Bubs and Timo, who were big figures from the set. But before we get into all of Lion Hood's history, we have to address the origins of Paru in general in order to fully understand the Lion Hoods. Paru Street has a history of grooming a lot of gangsters, but on the block's earlier days, it was widely known for its hustlers. Known as bank robbers back in the days, the Bourne family, along with Mickey Blue, Clarence Grandi, Lonnie Hall, and Victor were known as the Paru Boys early in the 1960s. And this block had nothing but families of brothers who all got along. So that street was down there one big family who down there did everything together. But by 1969, the birth of the Crips brought a lot of turmoil to locals and groups who had no gang affiliation. So in defense, the Bloods, like the Five Nine Brams, came along, followed by Paru. And from the jump, these guys stood on their own and went to war with anybody who came into their neighborhood starting issues, especially the Crips. The Paru Bloods identity came after their incident played out between Jody Crawford and Billy Flowers. I'll leave the link about what played out. It's a dope interview by Paru OG Marv, where he goes to depth about it. But long story short, it gained the Parus the nickname the Roosters. The Roosters are the color red, so naturally, they started calling themselves Bloods. Eventually, different subsets of the Paru Bloods started forming around Compton, and by the late 1970s, the Limehood Parus had arrived. This gang is a little younger compared to older Paru gangs, but they quickly established themselves as one of the most feared gangs throughout the 1980s and 90s. And on March 17, 1995, their violence made headlines, and unfortunately, the lives of two people were taken in the process. Darkwaller Beach is a beautiful state park in the Santa Monica Bay. It's known for its bonfires, big waves, and barbecues. But a short drive from Darkwaller is the gang infested neighborhoods of South Central Los Angeles. On March 17, 1995, two couples got into a car and drove the dock while together. Unfortunately, a few of them never made it back alive. That same day, several members of the Lime Hood Paru were at the beach. Kenji Howard, Edward Powell, and several other members had driven the car and spent the day causing trouble. According to a witness, Powell bought a gun he had obtained by trading away cocaine and used it to shoot at several airplanes, landing, and departed from a nearby Los Angeles International Airport. At 10 p.m., when the beach closed, police officers arrived and ordered everyone to leave. And while walking back to the cars, someone heard a voice out of Powell's car say, give me the strap, meaning give me the gun, as they started to drive off. Edward Powell drove his car after the car containing the two couples. As the two cars entered the freeway, Powell pulled the car containing the bloods up next to the two couples. None of the two couples were gang members, but as Powell's car put up next to theirs, the blood members began throwing up gang signs at him. Right after that, someone in Powell's car started shooting at the couples, letting off approximately 10 shots. Witnesses described seeing shots coming from the back passenger seat where Kenji Howard was sitting, and later, Howard admitted to shooting his gun out of the window. One of the four friends was killed immediately. That was Arquette Mieja, a young woman on leave from the Air Force to attend her parents' 25th anniversary. Another one of the four friends was Trayvon Johnson, who was also shot. He did not die immediately. In fact, he was in a coma and lived for 18 years until 2013 when he succumbed to his injuries. After the shooting, Powell drove Howard back to the gang's territory, but Howard was arrested the next day in possession of the gun. The gun was confiscated, tested, and determined to be the murder weapon. Officers also impounded Powell's vehicle and noted that the rear windows did not roll down. So who shot who? After Powell was arrested with the gun, he was released probably because he was a minor. However, Howard was interviewed nine days after he was caught with the gun. He waived his Miranda rights and said he saw Powell firing seven to eight shots. In other words, he told police that someone else was the murderer. Numerous witnesses said they saw Powell firing the shots. The pigs were understandably suspicious of the statements like that. Howard's statements did not get the detectives much confidence. He said he was sleeping when the shooting occurred even though it was only two minutes by car from the beach parking lot. He falsely claimed that he bought the gun from Powell the day after the shooting. Still, he was released after the interview on his promise to return the next day. But surprise, he broke his promise and fled to Seattle, 
where he remained on a run for six weeks until he was captured. After he was captured in Seattle, Howard interviewed again. Again, he denied being a shooter. He failed a polygraph test and he was interrogated for three hours. He then changed his story. He said that two other men made him shoot the gun. He said that he had not meant to hurt anybody. He said he was paying attention to what was capping the rounds and just shot out the window. He did not find out until a couple days later that he actually killed someone. He also gave details on how he shot. He said he rested his hand on top of the open window of the door, pointed the gun downwards, and fired several shots. In the end though, Kenji was charged and convicted of murder and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole in 35 years plus seven additional years. Howard appealed, but the Court of Appeal affirmed the judgment and the sentence. Man, rest in peace to all parties involved. It was said the couples had on blue that night and the Lionhood members mistook them for being rival crit members. It shows you the ruthlessness of the approach of these guys when it comes to their enemies. Let's get into rivals as we address it all. Rivals of the Limehood Pyrus. The Limehood Pyru Bloods share parts of their territory with the Compton Vario 70s, and for the most part, they've always been on good terms, but they are known to beef with a lot of gangs in the area. Their enemies with the Ducky Hood Compton Cribs, the Lime Ward Compton Cribs, the Kelly Park Compton Cribs, the Neighborhood Compton Cribs, the Atlantic Drive Compton Cribs, the Southside Compton Cribs, the Vario Chicano Gang, the Vario Segundo, and the Compton Vario Locos 13. Yeah, even the rivals know not to mess with the Limes. They give no fucks, they willing to do the time. Bars, nigga. When it comes to their main rivals, I couldn't really point out the biggest one. So anyone of OGs or anybody with their ears tapped in, y'all let me know who do y'all think is the biggest enemies that the Lime Hoods were going to go at it with. Y'all let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation with it. Danger rating of the Lime Hood Pyrus. The Lime Hood Pyrus are going to receive a danger rating of an 8.9 out of 10 based off of the gang's history of violence and gang wars in Compton. These niggas have always been known to go out with the ops, which is why they're respected in the streets. That's just my opinion though. Would y'all want higher or lower? Y'all let me know in the comments, man. Let's have a conversation. And give me some reasons why, man. Let me hear some stories. Let's have a conversation about it. Prominent figures from the set. Some of the founders of Lime Hood include Gangsta Bubs and Timo, who were big figures from the set. Also, Johan was a big face from the game. The Lime Hood Enforcer was known as a leader and one of the gang's muscles, but also considered a very intellectual person. Other prominent figures include Rick Dog, Samoan Sam, Pineapple, Evil Twin, Flacco Joe, Crow, Big Bam, Junebug, Benny Rue, Tone Bone, Limestone, Dusty, and Street Dog. In terms of current rappers, I couldn't really find any, so y'all let me know in the comments if y'all got any new up and current rappers from the set, man. Let's get their music heard. Let's get their music heard. Also, let me know in the comments if I'm leaving out any OGs who are no longer with us, man. Let their legs live on. Let their limbs live on. Current state of the Lime Hood Power Bloods. I tell you about my homeboy's name was Avery. He was standing on the corner. The crowds rolled by. The crowds rolled out, but I don't know why. You see, he stood there because he thought it was a crime. They rolled out his name and they said, let's try it. They pulled out the gat and they pulled the trigger. But Avery looked back and his eyes got big. Los Angeles has seen a lot of gangs come and go over the years. It's literally the epicenter of the term only the strong survive. And the Lime Hoods have definitely been doing more than surviving. The Lime Hood Pyrus originated over four decades ago and are still active to this day. Even after several gang wars and with a lot of its members been arrested or killed, this gang has grown to the point to where they have subsets in different states. They have cliques in Boston, Little Rock, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Seattle. But y'all let me know in the comments if I'm from your state, man. Rep for your state. That's it for the Lime Hood Pyrus. Y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? Did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong? Y'all let me know in the comments, man. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's have a conversation about it. Subscribe. Hit that bell if you're moving well. Y'all stay safe and dangerous out there.